Good morning. Good to have you all here for worship at Woodlawn this morning. Focus of our service, Fifth Sunday Epiphany, is the fact that we are God's chosen people by the power of the Holy Spirit working through the Word. We've been called to faith in Jesus as our Savior. That gives us a special place um, in God's kingdom, obviously. And then we are to live as children of God in this world as the salt and light that we'll hear about in the Gospel reading as God's special people. Order of service we're following today is setting number two. That starts on page 172 in the front part of your hymnal. We'll be using the alternate confession of sins. Uh, it'll also be obviously up on the screen and it's printed out in your worship folder as well. So we're going to start then. Oh no, take time to sign the red friendship register at some point during the service. All our worshipers, please do that. So we begin with our opening hymn, 633, Speak, O Lord.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done the things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God,
Almighty God, you sent your one and only Son as the word of life for our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Help us believe what the scriptures proclaim about him and do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated as our handbells choir plays brightest and best of the stars. The Old Testament lesson and also the basis of our sermon today is from the book of Exodus. We read in chapter 19, the first eight verses. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain, that is, Mount Sinai. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people, 
and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. The word of the Lord. Our psalm for today is Psalm 91. We're going to sing a, a hymn version of it, On Eagle's Wings. The New Testament lesson from the first epistle of Peter, we read in chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. Here we're instructed by Peter, courage to live as children of the light, because we've been called to, out of the darkness of our sin and unbelief, uh, to be children of the light. And that means we are God's treasured people. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The choir will now sing the gospel acclamation, glory to his name.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. We read from St. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, continuing our series of readings from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Here, as I said, we are now to be the salt and light of the world because we've been called to faith in Jesus as our Savior. We still use God's law then to be our guideline as we live our Christian lives out in the pagan world. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We sing the hymn of the day, hymn 630, Thy Strong Word.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, God's word for our devotion today is from the Old Testament lesson, Exodus chapter 19. Dear friends in Christ, I want to start with a little bit of, hopefully, audience participation this morning. Do you have something that you might call your treasured possession? Raise your hand if you're willing to tell me what that might be. Don't be bashful. Come on. Jeffrey? I have this train set in my living room. My treasured possession. A train set. Okay. Anybody else? Now that we've broken the ice? Come on. Deb, are you raising your hand or no? No? Okay. Mike? His race car, of course. Many of you have seen that race car at our church picnics over the last few years. So, a race car. And we've had a number of other guys had classic cars. Uh, Barracuda. Is that a Dodge Barracuda or is that Plymouth? Barracuda. Somebody had a Pontiac. But think of it as a kid. My mom said I had a special teddy bear. Dragged it wherever I went. I don't remember it. I don't have it anymore. Mrs. Klinger said she had her teddy bear yet for 71 years. Maybe it's a piece of jewelry, heirloom jewelry, antique jewelry handed down. I've got a ring that my grandfather gave to his intended, my, who would be my grandmother, back in 1928. I, as the oldest grandson, got that ring. And it's still got the inscription, GB to ED. So it might be, it could be anything. Maybe it's a pet. You know, we have pets, treasured possession, and we're crushed when we have to put them to sleep. All kinds of things could be our special treasure, a treasured possession. Well, that's the picture that God uses here. Those are the words that God uses here to describe his people Israel. And you know what? We're included in that too. So what we're going to do today is look at what made them so special or how did they get that designation and how do we get it and then how do we live as God's special treasure. We are God's treasured possession. Now, our text begins here by talking about what was happening to the people of Israel. This was three months, in a sense, after God had miraculously and powerfully delivered them from their slavery in Egypt. Using those ten plagues, God had forced Pharaoh, in a sense, to finally say, okay, enough, get out of here, Israelites, before we're all dead. Because those plagues had, had ruined the economy and taken the lives of the firstborn sons. And so God's people were set free, began that trek to the promised land. But of course, we know that Pharaoh changed his mind a a, a bit later and and chased after them with his army, pinned the the Israelites up against the Red Sea, and they grumbled and complained, why, Moses, you brought us out here to die in the wilderness. But God miraculously opened up, parted the waters, and the Israelites passed through on dry ground, and the Egyptians, when they pursued them, the waters came back and destroyed them. Again, they were set free. They were delivered. Then as they made their way over the next couple of months down into the Sinai wilderness and to the foot of Mount Sinai, they ran out of food. They grumbled and complained. But God sent them manna from heaven, that special miraculous food, water from a rock, flocks of quail to, to, be the, to serve as their meat, protection from their enemies. The list goes on and on. Why did he do it? Was it because they were such good and noble people? No, they were a bunch of complainers. But God did it out of his love for them. God brought them that far in in his faithfulness to the promises he had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they would have, you know, their descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore. That was this nation numbering some two million people. And so they come to the foot of Mount Sinai and God reveals that grace to them. He explains to them why he had done it and the purpose he had done it. He had done it simply out of his great love for them. Through Moses, God told the Israelites, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you will carefully listen to my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my special treasure out of all the nations. Although the entire earth is mine, you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy people. 
The hymn we just sang, rephrasing a hymn version of Psalm 91, uses the same phrase as the song, as that song we just sang, and the words that God uses here. Carried us, he carried them on eagles' wings. Now, I'm sure many of you know that picture already, but just to review it, uh, I've never witnessed it in person, but I've read accounts of people who did that, you know, the eagles build their nests up high in a tree or on the crag of a cliff or something like that. Well, when the baby eagles are ready to learn how to fly, the parents nudge them out of the nest and they start falling and they flap their wings wildly. And its purpose is to get them to train them to build up their muscles. And then right before they crash into the ground, the parent eagles sweep under, uh, dive underneath them and catch them and take them back up to the nest. And then they, start, they push them out of the nest again and over and over again. On one account I read, a guy, watched, a guy and his daughter watched it go on for over an hour, four or five times. The parent eagles did that to teach their babies to trust them that they weren't going to let them crash and, and, and get destroyed, but also to, to build up their well, their, their faith, their trust, until they could fly and soar for themselves. Well, in the same way, God was raising his people Israel up, as on eagles' wings, he says here, letting them, not letting them crash and be destroyed. He was training them to depend entirely on him, to look to him when troubles loomed, confident that he would be there to help them get through it. He wanted them to grow in their faith and in their trust in him, that he was indeed their loving and saving Lord. They were his people, and he wanted them to always realize he was their God. They were his treasured possessions. As I said, in doing so, he was fulfilling those promises that he had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By bringing them out of Egypt, God was being faithful that, well, their, Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars. They would be a great nation because through them, God was going to send the greatest deliverer. And that was the promised Messiah. And so for 1,500 years, as we study God's word, we see it's, well, the Israelites were the focus of biblical history. It wasn't because, again, it wasn't because they were so special, but simply because in his love, God had chosen them for that purpose. They were his treasured possession. Now, where do we fit in? It's 3,500 years after these words. We're not Israelites. I don't know, maybe some of you have set foot in, the, in, in Palestine and visited the sites in Israel and Jerusalem. But does that mean we are left outside of favored nation status because we've never been there? Because we're not descended from, physically descended from the Jews? Not at all. For reasons known only to himself, God chose you to be the New Testament Israel. We call it the doctrine of election. And while it's confusing for some people, because way back in eternity, before we were ever born or even thought of by our parents, before there were people in this world, God chose some to be saved or chose some to be his people. And that's not meant to to make us work hard, to try and earn that, but it's something he did simply out of his love. It's what we call grace. These Israelites, like I said, they didn't deserve it. They grumbled, complained all the way for the next 40 years and throughout their history, but they remained his treasured possession. God worked it out so that you heard the gospel, so that you learned about Jesus as your Savior, so that you've seen God's love and grace in action. God intends it so that we simply take comfort in the fact of the doctrine of election is a comforting one, that we are God's chosen people. Not, again, not because we would be such good people that we had done anything to deserve it. You know, we're born with a sinful nature that follows its own way. And wants to join in with the world in its materialism and greed and immorality and pleasure-seeking. And even as Christians, we often grumble. We turn our backs when it comes time to worship and we forget about receiving the Lord's Supper. No reason at all that God should choose us as his treasured possession. But in his love, he planned and carried it out so that we were exposed to the gospel. For many of us, it was through our parents 
who brought us perhaps to be baptized, sent us to Sunday school, Christian schools. Maybe it was through a pastor or a teacher. Maybe it was a future spouse or a current spouse that shared the gospel with us. However it was done, God worked it out so that you now have become part of his chosen people, his holy nation, a people who belong to him. Peter said in our reading, at one time you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. One time you did not receive mercy, but now you have been shown mercy. Our guilt and punishment have been washed away. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we were brought to faith in Jesus and became part of the Holy Christian Church. So even though our, our lives aren't centered on that piece of ground on the east end of the Mediterranean Sea, our journey is to a different promised land, our promised land in heaven, where our Savior and King has prepared a place for us, a place we look forward to achieving, to receiving that goal. We are the objects. As we go through this life, we are the objects of his grace. And if you ever have any doubts about that, all you have to do is look at the cross. You probably have them someplace in your house. Maybe you're wearing a cross right now. Just look at that cross, and there you see how great that love God has for you, that you are indeed his treasured possession. Now, that teddy bear I dragged along around for a couple of years, my mom said, he couldn't show me any, me any kind of love and affection. Maybe that treasured possession can't do it. A dog maybe could, or a cat might, but... Uh, but we do like to be the object of affection, right? Well, since we're the object of affection, God's affection, how do we respond to that? We are to be totally dedicated to serving him. Not because we have to, but because we want to. Because we look at what he's done for us. That's our motivating factor. When the Israelites heard these words from Moses, the leaders all said, we'll do everything the Lord has said. Now, they fell short of that a lot of times but God still maintained them as his chosen people. They were willing to give their best, didn't always do it. But as they made that way to the promised land, they were going to be and they would remain God's treasured possession. And we are to respond to God's grace with the very same words that they used. We will do everything. We'll do our very best, Lord, to live as the children of light, to be the light in the world that is seems to be growing darker and darker in sin and wickedness. We will be the salt of the earth, influencing by our good deeds and our faithful lives and our words, our calls to repentance and faith. We will be a salt that influences, to the best of our abilities, the, the pagan world in which we live. Yeah, it's that love of God that's our motivation now. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's our privilege. We have the ability to respond. You're here to do that right now, to praise and, and worship him, to be assured through word and sacrament of his love and forgiveness. That's why you use that word in your private study at home, join in the classes here. It's why you go in repentance to the Lord's table when we, as we offer it. It's why you'll witness to your friends and neighbors about this wonderful God we have. Why you'll invite them to come and to learn about Jesus. Why you will support gospel missions and ministry with your hard-earned dollars and your precious time. You love the Lord. You're thrilled that he's made you his treasured possession. And that's why you will carry out your role as people of God, no matter what the situation in which to, into which God places you. Husband, wife, parent, child, rich, poor, young, old, male, female. You will live as people of God. You'll to use your energy and, and your time in serving him. The world may not recognize that. Maybe not even hardly anybody will recognize it. But we do it because we know God recognizes it. The world may only see it and ridicule us for it. Show scorn towards us for living as people of God. But we'll keep doing it because that's our response to being chosen as God's treasured people. That's something, something nobody can take away from you. 
unless you throw it away. But it's a treasure that carries with it lasting value. So dear friends, rejoice in that fact that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people belonging to God. Not earned, not deserved. It's all about God's grace and God's love. And because of that, we've seen and heard great things. We know about that Savior who's preparing a place for us in heaven, who's leading us on a trek through this life to that promised land, our promised land of eternal life with him in heaven. So let us live in joyful obedience to him because we are God's treasured possession. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We now join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll now present our offerings to the Lord and offer a prayer. Dearest Lord Jesus, in love you came into this world and laid down your life for our sins. Now, as your chosen people, we humbly desire to return your love, to show our gratitude, offer our thanks through these gifts and offerings. By your infinite wisdom and gracious will, help the, use these gifts to further the preaching of the gospel to souls your blood has bought. May we always give our gifts with sincerity and generosity, moved by your love for us and our love for you. We ask this in your name. Amen. And we stand and pray. In our prayers today, we include a prayer for our sister in Christ, Woodlawn member Leola Baker whose departure from this life, it seems God is going to be calling her home to heaven soon. We pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, what joy fills our heart because you've called us to be your children, made us part of your, your treasured possession. Now, Lord, you call on us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, to have an impact by our lives, by our actions, by our words, to have an impact in this world. But Lord, we must confess that we do not always measure up to your expectations. We've not always been the salt in our society or holding up the light of the gospel to the people around us. We seek your forgiveness for those sins, Lord. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, enable us to overcome our reluctance and our weaknesses to live now, Lord, as your treasured people. Help us to live lives worthy of that calling that we've received. We ask this in your name. And eternal Father, we also ask that you show your mercy and compassion toward Leola Baker, whose departure from this life seems near at hand. As she passes through the valley of the shadow of death, comfort her with the, your unfailing promise that you're with her, that she need not be overcome by fear. If it is your will, Lord, spare her extreme physical pain. Encourage her and her loved ones with the sure hope of heavenly glory that awaits all who trust in Jesus for deliverance. Into your hands we commit here, O Lord, and we join together in the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May be seated. We sing hymn 697, May We Your Precepts, Lord, Fulfill. 697. We again stand for prayer. Blessed Lord, you've given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. May be seated for our closing hymn. 957, the first two verses. Rejoice, angelic choir. New words to a familiar melody, but they've changed a couple of notes, so you might want to follow along in the hymnal. 957, first two verses.
Greetings again to all of you in the name of the Lord Jesus. It was good to have had you here for worship, especially our guests and visitors who are joining us today. I want to review some of the announcements in your, in the, uh, in your worship folder. One addition, a correction that's omitted, was the fact that there is Girl and Boy Pioneers this coming Tuesday, 6 o'clock in the classrooms uh, on the upper level here. So uh, boys and girls, uh, be sure you're here for that. Over at Good Shepherd at 6.30, there will be a call meeting. Voters uh, will be calling, hopefully, a, uh, an individual for our seventh grade classroom uh, at our Living Hope School for the fall. So all the voters, be sh sure to be over at Good Shepherd in the sanctuary at 6.30 tomorrow evening. Next Sunday, we're starting a new topic in our Sunday morning Bible classes. Uh, same topic at both the Good Shepherd campus and here on worship what it means, why we worship, why we do the things that we do, what they're all about. So if you're at all interested in that, um, join us, 9.15, um, downstairs in the cafeteria here or over in the lower level at Good Shepherd as well. Um, a week from tomorrow, uh, the Blood Center, Aversity Blood Center, will be having a drive here at, at Woodlawn campus uh, uh, from two until six. There are still a number of slots available uh, for donating. Um, you can sign up on the sheets to the ta on the table to the left as you exit the sanctuary, or you can also use the uh, uh, sign up uh, uh, link that's printed in your uh, announcements. And then I guess uh, sometime in mid March, there's going to be a re retirement party for somebody here at Woodlawn. Um, but I've been asked, especially to emphasize the fact that and everybody's welcome, obviously, to the 10:30 service, which will be. Uh, the highlight of it, but then there's a, a meal and a program afterwards. You do need to sign up for that, and they want to order the food the 15th of February. So you've got 10 days left to sign up for that. The link to do that is uh, printed in your announcement. So hope to see you there. With that, uh, God's blessings on your week.